This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. We then went on and we described what happens in the far field and said that there's a relationship between the magnetic and electric fields. And that relationship, that eta, which is the constant, uh, which relates the magnitude of the electric field to the magnetic field, is also known as the wave impedance. And in air, the wave impedance has a value of about 377 ohms. We then went through um, and talked about the propagation um, constant in an arbitrary material. And then we finished off by talking about what happens to an electromagnetic wave in a good conductor and essentially derived the, uh, the skin depth, which we said was where the signal it attenuates by 33%. Right. And we went through and did a couple of calculations where we said, depending on the conductivity of the material, we can work out what the skin depth was. And then we also talked about briefly about hey, if you're at 60 gig or very high frequencies, you, you don't need to go out and buy these very expensive um, waveguides or antennas. You can actually build them yourself with a 3D printer and a little bit of electroplating. So that's the, that, lecture, that was lecture two in review. So now we're going to move on and begin talking about antennas. So who has had any experience in... I mean, of course you've all used an antenna because you're all you know, using Wi-Fi or using a phone, but who's had any experience, any experience in either designing or specifying an antenna for, for some kind of system? Anybody? Okay. What, okay, so before we start that, um, or we, before we continue, then why do we use antennas? Yes. To transfer information, it's to transfer energy, right? And that in, that energy may have um, information content because we're even now getting to the stage, and it might be, and it's something that's interesting for all of you to look at is we're even getting to the stage where we can actually transfer power wirelessly, right? Now, the mechanism by which you do that isn't radiating power like what we're talking about here in antennas. It's more about the in those particular cases, you're actually using mutual coupling and act, trying to couple those two structures in the near field, which we were going to talk about in the, in, in the, in the next part of this lecture. Sorry, yeah, in, in, in this lecture. Um, but, yeah, so, so you can actually use it to transfer power and signals. Now, can anyone tell me some basic type of antennas? Not, not here I'm talking about, you know, their, their radiated patterns. Can anyone tell me some of the antennas they've actually seen out in the wild. <coughs> Come on, guys. Yes. Like a parabola antenna? To... Yes. I don't know what's happened here. Uh, does anyone know? I think it's on the laptop. It's the bus station. Ah. Okay, let me do this. Let me see this emergency. All right, cool. Yeah, well, I need to focus it. So, so there's a, you said a parabolic uh, antenna, is that correct? Okay. Um, has anyone seen an antenna on a PCB board? Yay, nay, maybe? This is flushing it out. So, has anyone seen a dipole antenna? Dipole? Okay, so what I've done, just for everyone's benefit, because it's absolutely key that you, as engineers, that you, you're, you're familiar with some, you know, some of the basic antennas and basic antenna structures. What I've done is, I've, I, as, as I said when I was started off the lecture, where um, a lot, maybe some of you weren't here, there's some app notes and some. Um, how do you call it, some background information that I've also added 
um, to the to LMS. Download it, have a look. It's important for your, in just for your background to know the different types of antennas and you know some of their desirable or undesirable properties. But one of the most common ones that you actually put on a PCB board is actually a dipole or an embedded, uh, inverted F or a P type of antenna. Now, as you, and as you can imagine, they, they all have different radiation patterns, and that's what we're going to talk about now before we start working out how do we, are we able to calculate that radiation pattern given at a particular geometry um, and a assumed current distribution on that particular antenna. So let's begin with some of the most basic um, concepts uh, on antennas. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so there's a concept of an isotropic radiator, right? So we've said an antenna, what an antenna does is actually you put energy into, its port, into a port um, and it actually radiates energy. And an isotropic radiator or an isotropic antenna, they don't exist. There might be good approximations, but they don't really exist. Isotropic radiators are ones which radiate their energy equally in all directions. So you can think of it, if you had an isotropic radiator at a, at, at a center of a sphere, the energy would be equally distributed across the surface of that sphere. Now, there are directional antennas, right? Sorry. And, sorry, yeah, right. sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Let me do the following. Just, no. Okay, because that, that still works, but it's still... This seems to back, be back up again. Let me... Guys, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. It was working. Uh, This is completely out of focus. Okay. Uh, can you read it at all, or is it just ter absolutely terrible? Uh, you, you've got the, You should have the notes anyway. Okay. So you've got a directional antenna, right? And a directional antenna. Um, what it does is, as, as you can imagine, the, the energy isn't distributed equally, but there is a preferential direction where the energy is either where the energy is transmitted. Okay. Now, can anyone tell me why may it be desirable to have a um, a, a directional antenna. Yes? So if we already know where the information has to go, then we can just maximize the power in that direction. Right. Not waste power. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So you can actually put your power into a particular direction. And what that means is if you're not radiating power in all directions, and you're putting it more in one direction, as you can imagine, it's almost like a hose, right, where you're spraying out water. If you're spraying it in all directions, the hose, you know, the, the, the water goes to a particular distance, you, you um, make the water more directional, or the, the, the stream of water more directional, it actually goes further. That's, that's why people, you know, produce and use directional antennas. So therefore, there's some advantages, and, always, and there's also some disadvantages. And the disadvantages are, of course, relates to the fact where all of a sudden you now need to know where your information or where your signal is going to be, needs to be transmitted, right? So, for example, imagine you had a highly directional antenna in your phone, right? Then you'd almost have to try to find the base station where what you try to do with this is you make it as omnidirectional as possible. So, therefore, you can hold it like this and you can hold it like this and I could be doing this and you can still communicate with the base station and transmit your data and still maintain the WeChat com um, conversation, you know, seamlessly. 
Okay. Now, there's something that people usually get confused with, um, and in the literature, there's this concept called omnidirectional antennas. That's not the same as an isotropic antenna. Okay? The difference being an omnidirectional antenna is an antenna which has one of its principal, it, it radiates equally on one of its principal axes, equally. On one of its principal axes, it radiates equally. But it doesn't mean on all axes, it needs to radiate equally, right? And what we'll do is we'll talk about a dipole, right? And I'll show you the radiation pattern of a dipole. And you'll see, even though it radiates on the H-plane um, um, how do you call it, equally, you know, on the E-plane it doesn't. Don't worry about H and E-planes yet. I'm going to talk about them in the next few seconds. Okay. Now, the next thing we want to know about antennas is usually we, we talk about polarization of antennas um, and we'll go into greater details about polarization of antennas but usually people talk about linearly polarized antenna or an antenna's polarization. Okay. And an antenna's polarization, what people are usually referring to is the direction of the E field, or the electric field of that particular antenna. Right? Um, yeah, so there's, and what you can also do is when you're looking at one of these antennas, like if you're looking at a dipole or if you're looking at some other structure, like a horn antenna, there is, especially if you're transmitting a TEM wave or transverse electromagnetic wave, you've got an E field and a H field, which are perpendicular to each other. Um, and what you want to do is to be able to look at all that, that information in order to be able to convey or understand what that radiation pattern is from that antenna has. Okay? Okay. So I said that this, that I was going to show you a, an antenna pattern. So let's, 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 let's have a look at it. Okay. Has anyone seen this donut pattern before? Okay. That's a dipole. Does anyone know what a dipole is? I mean, I'll, we'll derive it and show you dual the mathematics at some stage. But does anyone know what a dipole antenna looks like? No? Um, okay. Okay, so usually what you've got is you've got uh, a, essentially almost just literally two wires. Right? And one goes up and one goes down. Essentially, you're trying to create an asymmetry, right, in, in, in this in the distribution of current. And if you because if it was symmetrical, you know, um, uh, Gauss's law for magnetic fields tells us that it would be zero, right? So you try to separate it out. And what happens is you excite these, these two pieces of wire. Now, usually this is a coax, and these are just two pieces of wire. And that's actually that discontinuity and asymmetry it actually radiates. And that's what a dipole antenna looks like. And you've got dipoles antennas everywhere. They're, they're created on PCB boards, they're created. Um, on phones, they're created as part of a whole bunch of structures. Now here, what I'm showing you is the radiation pattern for a small dipole, dipole right? And what dictates, or this, when I say a, a small or a large dipole, usually what I'm talking about is how large is that structure relative to a wavelength of the, the signal that we're actually putting onto that actual structure. Right. Now, here, so there's some important things that we need to look at. Okay. Now, if we were, if we knew, as, as an example, that we had this structure, and for argument's sake, and I'll go into much greater detail in the next few lectures, but for argument's sake, suppose I had, we knew that the current distribution was doing something like this, so therefore there's current going up, um, and then there's also, um, we've got the distribution of current on this structure, right? Where, if we looked at Ampere's law or right-hand rule or whatever, where, how would we know 
if I'm as I'm looking at this structure here, where would the E field be and where would the H field or magnetic field be? So if you've got flow of current, what does the right hand rule say? Yeah. So it would be in, in, in this plane, right? So current's going up or down, it doesn't really matter, but it's in the it's perpendicular to the the flow of not yeah, perpendicular to the flow of current. And then also you've got so you've got your E field this way and you've got your H field around. And essentially that's what this donut structure is actually showing to you. It's actually showing to you the radiation pattern for this particular small dipole. And it's showing showing you specifically, it's showing you the direction of the electric field and it's also showing you the direction of the magnetic field. Right? But drawn as a three-dimensional structure. Okay? Now, usually what, what happens when you're looking at these diagrams, people don't usually draw three-dimensional structures because it's usually difficult to do that, right? And usually data sheets, they only show you the two-dimensional structure. So if they were showing you the E and the H field, can anyone tell me what they think the E and the H field would look like for this, given this donut structure? Okay, so we said E field is up and down. So if we're looking perpendicular, up and down, what, what, what will we see? We'll see... Right? I'm actually... I've got that donut, and I'm looking through the donut. Perpendic, you know, along, you know, this axis, you know, parallel to the e, e axis, right? So if I'm looking there, I see this, right? So because it goes in and out. And if I'm looking at the H field, H plane, it's a circle, right? So we've got H and E. So usually what happens in the data sheet is they show you the H plane and the E plane. That's all they're doing. <laughs> okay, now the next thing, and this is just, just for everyone's benefit, uh, and another very common antenna structure that people you know, use uh, is a horn antenna. And essentially, has anyone seen a horn? Yeah? Anyone else? Yep, cool. Yeah, good, all right. So essentially, this structure also radiates. It's a little bit different. It's, it's, it's a waveguide rather than a, 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 you know, a, a simpler structure uh, like we see in the dipole. And essentially, it's highly directional. And you see this is the radiation pattern that you get out of it. And for a horn, what happens is the largest dimension is the direction of the E field, and the, the other dimension is the magnetic or the H field. So that's just a little bit of information. You don't need, to, you, you, for that you just have to, there's nothing more than just saying, Stan told me a little bit of information for a horn, the E field is um, parallel to the, the, um, uh, the dimension, the, the larger dimension and the H is perpendicular to that. And it has a, and then a horn antenna, has a very uh, directional um, uh, radiation pattern. Okay. Let's move on. Now, the, just so for everyone's benefit, uh, all I've done here, there's a book called Balanus, called Antenna Theory. This is where, where I'm actually stealing, copying uh, these diagrams for, from, right? Just, just as an FYI. Now, the other thing that we would like to know if, if somebody gives us a radiation pattern is, we said we want to know what the radiation uh, pattern looks like, but we also want to know, what we also know is there's, the radiation pattern isn't this nice, uniform, you know, uh, three-dimensional object, right? And usually, like for example, when you're designing a uh, an antenna or specifying an antenna or even when you look at the um, antennas, the directional sector antennas that you see on uh, cellular base stations, they have a radiation pattern 
in a particular direction. But they also have other types, of, you know, the radiation pattern just doesn't fall off to zero off the main beam, right? So here what we're saying is this is the main beam and usually when you're specifying the beam, what you do is you specify the, uh, the, the half-power uh, beam width, which is where the power drops by 3 dB. Um, and then some of the other structures that you would like to see or try to understand is, you know, you've got side lobes, which are these other lobes which exist in the structure which are not as, which are not as large as the main lobe. And sometimes, or almost certainly, uh, most cases you also see a back lobe. Right. And usually what that means is if you've got an, a, a radiating uh, antenna base station and, you, and, you know, and you've got it in front of your house, right, because sometimes that is the case, right, and then the Telstra or whoever <coughs> engineer comes and says, oh, don't worry, it's pointing that way. Look, it's pointing that way. Well, you've got to ask them, well, what's the front-to-back ratio? Because even though you're transmitting 10 watts that way, if, if it's only, you know, 20 dB down, the front to back ratio is only 20 dB, well, guess what? I'm getting a watt into my house or whatever. If it's 100 watts, I'm getting 10 watts into my house and I'm not particularly happy. Um, and, and again, this is a three-dimensional structure here I'm drawing. It's been drawn as a two-dimensional structure. Okay. So, so what have we learned so far? We, we've said that, you know, there's antennas. Antennas, one of the interesting components or one of the interesting attributes of an, of an antenna or an important attribute of an antenna are its radiation pattern. Um, and, you know, in the radiation pattern, there's an E and a H field, a H component. And even for the total power, there's a main lobe and then there's potentially side lobes or... Um, and even, you know, a back row. Okay. okay. <coughs> now, we'll talk a little bit about, and, and again, this is still some more background material. Um, we're going to talk about an antenna. All right. And we said, in this particular case, we've got a little dipole antenna. Right. And... You know, there's multiple regions. So, so there's certain, if, depending on how far away we are from our, that antenna, we're going to see differences in the electric fields and the magnetic fields. Right? And it's not as simple <coughs> as the, you know, the, the um, field being just larger in the near field, right? And that's why I'm trying to emphasize or try to go, th I'm going through this, is to say to you, well, there are three major components or three major regions to an, in to, to an antenna, depending on how far away or how close you are to an antenna. <coughs> um, the first bit is in the near field or called the reactive near field. And it's usually, you know, um, defined is anything that's closer than the largest dimension of the antenna divided by the wavelength, you know, divide, square root. Right, so therefore, if you're within, you can think about it, if, you know, if you're within a wavelength of an antenna, you're pretty close, you know, to being in its near field, okay, or reacting near field. Why do we care? And I don't think I'll go into details in the, in the through the lecture course, but this, can anyone tell me why would anyone care about the reactive near field for, of an antenna? Okay. Um, can anyone guess? Has anyone measured an antenna pattern? No. Okay, let me ask you a different way. Suppose you're designing a PCB board, right? Okay. And on that PCB board, you're either going to fabricate an antenna by you know, putting down a bit of metal, or you're going to buy a chip which acts as an antenna. It's antenna, um, you know, little antenna chips. The reason why you care where the reactive near field is, is because anything 
that goes or is within the antenna's reactive near field actually affects the radiation pattern. And it also affects the, the input impedance to that antenna. So if you're in the reactive near field, that whatever's in there is actually now become part of the antenna. Right? So you usually when you're designing or fabricating a component, you try to get everything out or further away from the you know, re reactive near field. Now, the other thing, the reason why that's important, and we'll see this when we go through the derivation of a, uh, a di the radiation pattern uh, and the power uh, radiated from a, uh, a dipole, is that the fields in the reactive near field, the actual fields, the electric field at the field and the magnetic field, change very quickly. And the values are very hard to define, right? So they change very quickly. They can be very, very large. And even though you might have an antenna which says, you know, you might have just one watt of the power output in the far, far field, you might go put your finger on it and you might get a big shock, right? Because the, the, the fields in the you know, that are in the reactive near field are very, not very well defined and they can be very, very large. And what we'll do is we'll show, at least for a dipole, they can go as one on our cubed. If they are small, guess what? The number can be very, very large. Right, so you can have very arbitrary large um, fields. And that's partly the reason when you show up to a service station, right, they tell you to switch off your phone. It's not that it's going to, like, the, if you're in the far field, that that's going to cause any issues, right? That, that's not, that doesn't cause, you know, you know what the power is and the power is quite low. But generally what happens is if, you, if the antenna or antenna structure, you, you know, which can have arbitrary high voltages and it can also generate sparks, is near fuel well and or, uh, fuel vapors, something can go bang and then you can be very unhappy, right? So we, we talked about the reactive near field and, and we said essentially anything in the reactive near field is for all intensive purposes part of the antenna and also the fields in that area are very hard to define and are very fast, quickly varying. Now there's the next region which is between the far field and the uh, near field, and that's usually called the radiating near field. That's, for whatever reason people define that, that's somewhere in between. Usually what you try to do is everything that you, all other components on a PCB board or, or some other structure, you try to get everything at least uh, further away, um, or at least in the radiating near field. Okay, and the, what you usually see in textbooks and you see um, and when, you, when people are showing you antennas like the donut structure we were showing you, essentially they're actually showing you the radiation pattern in the far field. And that's regions which are many wavelengths away <coughs> from the antenna. Now, question. If I said to you that I have a dipole, I'm in the far field, and the electric field was one volt per meter, can anyone tell me what would be the magnetic field? We're in, in free space. It was part of the lecture review, right? Lecture one or lecture two review. It was the wave impedance, right? So you go E times E field times eta, the wave impedance equals H. That relationship only holds in the far field, right? Because in the near field, E cross H, you know, don't, you know, the relationship, they aren't necessarily orthogonal. There's a whole bunch of issues that you need to, to worry about. Okay. Who knows who's encountered the pointing vector before? 
who has not encountered the pointing vector before? You haven't? Okay. You haven't? No? Anyone else? All right. Okay. All right. Um, so what the pointing vector is, and you know, is essentially if you're trying to work out the flow of power, right? The pointing vector is the density that is flowing in a particular direction. Right. So you're, what you've got is, if I tell you the electric, you, we've got a TEM wave, and the electric field is in the one particular direction, and we know that it's in the far field, we can also work out what the H is, or somebody can specify the H, or we, 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 we've solved Maxwell's equations in, in, in that medium, we can work out what H is. And then what we do is we've got the pointing vector, and we can also work out the instantaneous power, which is equal to the pointing vector, which is a density integrated over a surface. Okay? And what I'll do here is very briefly just say, well, um, if I've got an electric field, I'll write it in phasor form, and if I've got a magnetic field, and, and I'll write it in phasor form, what I'm able to do is write W, which is E cross, um, e cross H, if there's a real and imaginary component, and the average power, if you, if you want to be able to, because remember, it, whenever you, you, you've got the, 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 uh, the power density, there's power which is being radiated, and there's power which is being used in order to generate and sustain those magnetic and electric fields, in order to enable you to radiate that structure. Remember when we had the electron and we said we were going to jiggle that electron? That electron had an, a Coulomb force or Coulomb field associated with it and then it had an electrostatic field. And it also, because it was being moved, it, even with constant velocity, it had a magnetic field. So that's, that's all it's saying, that there, there's a component which is just, um, because, of the, the, because of charge, there is a, uh, there is, fields which are used which to, in order to generate this, the, 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 the fields you know, the fields themselves which are better and there's energy stored in that and then there's also the radiated component. Now what I'll do is briefly define a concept called radiation intensity and that's just W radiated times R squared it's just a definition um, and the reason why we do that is because we use that to define the directivity of an antenna. And essentially, the directivity of, the, of an antenna is how much power is radiated in a particular direction versus all other power that's radiated. Right, and this gives us the ability or the machinery in order to be able to calculate that. And if you're trying to work out what the maximum directivity of an antenna is, you just say U max, which is just 4 pi U max um, on P radiated. Okay? Now let's do an example. How are we doing for time? All right, good. good. Okay. And the example is as follows, right? Suppose, and don't stress out at the moment, I'm just saying that there's this um, dipole, and I'm going to give you the characteristics of this dipole, and I'm going to say the, we've got an infinitesimal dipole, which is a very small dipole, um, where the length is much, much smaller than a wavelength. And what we want to do, or what we're told is the radiation intensity is given by A naught sine squared theta on R. For the time being, assume this, this, somebody just told you that, and we'll go into greater details on how that is derived, but at the moment, just assume somebody told you the radiation, in, uh, radiation intensity for an antenna, for an infinitesimal dipole, is equal to this, uh, this function. Um, and well, what we want to do is determine the maximum directivity of this antenna and express the directivity as a function of directional angle theta and phi. So we've said um, 
that the radiation intensity is R squared times WR, and in this particular case, it's just um, sine squared theta. Um, and the maximum radiation intensity is directed along theta equals pi on 2 because we know sine theta, sine of 90 is 1, which is the largest value. And what we're able to do is go through the calculation and work out the total radiated power, which is uh, U ds. If we go through and just do the integral of sine squared theta over the surface of a sphere, what we get is just A naught 8 pi on 3. Now, if we go, if we continue that calculation and we work out what the maximum directivity is, we go 4 pi U max on peak total power radiated. We said that U max was um, A naught because sine squared the, the, ma the maximum value of sine squared theta is 1, so it's 4 pi a naught on 8 pi on 3 A naught, which is 3 on 2, right? So therefore, it tells us approximately for a very small um, dipole or an infinitesimal dipole, its directivity is 3 on 2, right? And usually what people do is they usually um, express that as a dB, so usually what you would do is you'd say, you know, 10 log 10 of that value in order to get you know, its directivity, and it's usually re um, referred to as dBi, right? Because you use it, use it to reference it to a, an isotropic antenna. Now, the directivity is a fun function of angle. What we do is rather than working out where the max is, we leave the, the, the relationship sine squared theta, so therefore we see that the directivity as an angle of theta is just 1.5 sine squared theta, right? Nothing particularly exciting um, other than you now know how to work out the directivity of a, of, of, of a, of a dipole if you had the radiation intensity. Right. Now, but as engineers, what you find is sometimes you need some quick and dirty techniques in order to work out what the derivative is, right? So rather than going through some very complex um, calculations in order to work out what the derivative is, sometimes you can say, well, it's close enough and it's good enough for government work. You know what I mean? It's, you can just do it very, very quickly. Um, and here what I'll do is talk about some very quick and dirty methods, but they're good enough for most, uh, for most uh, applications. So what I'm, so essentially all I'm saying is if you wanted to work out the directivity in radians or in, a, a, or in degrees, if someone said to you, hey, we've got an antenna and the beam pattern, the half, um, half power beam width in azimuth and elevation is 30 or 60 degrees, okay, you can actually use this quick and dirty technique, depending if you want to use it in radians or if you want to use it in, de in degrees, you can just say, well, 41,000, you can even forget about the 253, you can say 41,000 divided by 30 degrees being within, um, you know, in azimuth, 30 degrees in elevation, so it's 41,000 divided by 900, um, which is, I can't do the calculations off the top of my head, what, 42, 40, uh, yeah, 42, 43, 10 log 10 of 42 is, I don't know, uh, can someone oops, calculate? Okay, so what am I, let me just put it on the board, so just, I'm getting a few blank faces, so let me, let me tell you what I'm trying to do. Okay. Quick and dirty, right? Rather than doing all these complex integrals, right? Suppose somebody said to you, hey, we've got an antenna pattern. And this antenna pattern is like a cone. And this angle, this, which denotes the half beam width, is 30 degrees. And this one's 30 degrees. What's the gain of that? What's the directivity of that antenna? It's a cone. Sorry, it's. 
Uh, I, I assume I can't write on this. Uh, okay, let me write it again. Uh, is this one better? Okay. Suppose we've got a cone. And this angle is 30 degrees. And this angle is 30 degrees, right? Okay, so you've got 30, 30, right? Okay. What's its directivity? All right. Assume I'm describing to you the half power bandwidth. Well, bandwidth, not bandwidth. Bandwidth. Okay? And I said to you, what's its directivity? What's, it, what's, it, what's its directivity? You can go through and try to work out, you know, radiation intensity, and you go there and you sit, and six or seven hours later, maybe, uh, depending on uh, how capable you are in mathematics, you might get the answer, and you might even get it wrong, right? Because uh, you make, you know, some silly mistake. The point I'm making is that you can actually work it out in a very quick and dirty mechanism way by just saying, well, the derivative is approximately 41,000 on 30 degrees by 30 degrees. So it's 41,000 on 900. Uh, 41 by 9 is what? 40, 40, 40, 40. 40. No, that's 41, right? 40, is it 40, 45? Yeah. Yes, All right, 45. 45. So 10 log 10 of 45 is? What's 10 log 10 of? Sorry? 16.5? Yeah. So this antenna has a directivity of 16.5 dB. That's simple, right? I can do. So I guess what am I, what am I saying here? Well, I can do the formal mathematics, which will take you a very long time in order to work out that number. Or you can do a quick and dirty, and I can guarantee you, you're probably less than a half dB off by doing this. So it's just showing you some tricks that we use as engineers. Like, for example, if you, you know, if someone said to me, I built this antenna and it's, and, and it's got 40 dB gain. You know, then I'll be like, oh, really? Okay, so what's its band, uh, band with in the air, in azimuth? How about elevation? You'll give me the numbers, and within a few seconds, I'll tell you, ah, this person's bullshitting. Sorry, I shouldn't be saying that because it's being recorded. <laughs> this person's not telling me the truth, right? So it's just some quick and dirty ways which helps you build that engineering intuition in order to be able to work out what the... Uh, requirement, or what the, the value of directivity of a particular antenna pattern is. And of course, as we've said, the directivity of the, the, the antenna, I should say antenna directivity, not gain. Let me correct that because gain means something very specific and I shouldn't be calling it gain. Antenna directivity in dB is 10 log 10 of D naught. Okay. How are we doing for time? We've got 12 more minutes. Good. So how's the pace of the lecture? Is it going too fast for you? Are you all understanding something or am I... No. Too fast. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Alright, um, so here, this is again r other ways of which being able to work out uh, omnidirectional patterns and all I'm doing here is for most patterns you can rewrite the radiation intensity as a function of sine n theta, right? That's, for whatever reason, antenna structures have this very interesting property and there's people that out there that either Posa or Balanus have worked out, again, some other ways in which to be able to work out the directivity, which is crude, which is crude, but better than this very crude approximation. Okay, let's talk about antenna gain, and then I might actually 
um, stop after antenna gain. Okay. Antenna gain, right? So when we talk about, we've talked about directivity, but we also want to talk about antenna gain, which is essentially defined as the directivity multiplied by any losses in, in the actual antenna, right? The efficiency of the antenna, right? But what's important here, and I need to emphasize this, is when we're talking about gain, we do not include impedance mismatch. All right, so essentially what we're saying is if we've got the Um, uh, if we've got an, a, an antenna, okay, and we'll talk about transmission lines and impedance matching in the next few lectures, but when you're talking about gain of an antenna, you assume that, that you, when we're talking about the power, it's the power that's actually been accepted into the port of the antenna. Not You don't take into account the, the incident power where there might be a component which is reflected back. Okay? And the gain is essentially the directivity multiplied by a, the efficiency of that antenna, which is essentially the efficiency is here is essentially due to either dielectric losses or resistive losses in the actual antenna structure itself. Right? So you, all, all I'm doing here mm -hmm. is saying, hey, we've got the directivity, we want to work out the gain, uh, all we do is we've got a, a, the, um, the losses into the antenna, and if we've got the losses in the antenna and essentially the efficiency, and I've got the directivity, I can actually work out the gain. Okay? Um, now, usually, and for whatever reason, sometimes people get confused, when I say a lossless antenna, what do I mean about this ECD? It's equal to one, right? So just, if you see it in an exam or you see it on the test, don't freak out. If I'm saying lossless antenna, what I'm saying is ECD is one. Don't, don't stress out, ECD is one. That's all it means, right? Or I might say, yes? So when you say the gain, it's like the gain right after the antenna? Or no, so, so the gain is here, oh, right? Okay. So it's power that's, so the gain is the power that's accepted into the port of the antenna is essentially, you know, how, how is that energy directed, all right? And, and essentially, an antenna is a passive structure, right? So the only thing that an antenna can do is lose some power, right? And it then can actually direct it in a particular direction. That's the only thing that an, an, an antenna or a passive antenna can do. Right, and this is the definition of gain of an antenna. Remember, do not get confused and actually look at what happens here where the power is ref reflected because there are circumstances where the antenna is mismatched and there is power is reflected from that port. When we're calculating gain, we're assuming that we're, we're only taking into account the power that's accepted into that port. Okay? All right, now, I think I will leave it there. There's seven minutes to spare, but that just gives you a little bit of a breathing space. Um, and then you can, uh, but please read uh, those couple of extra uh, uh, pieces of materials that I've given you. I mean, this, this is all, the stress that I'm suffering, feeling at the moment is, is all these things that I think are absolutely key for you to know as before you go out into before you go out into your first interviews, uh, especially in electronics or RF space, and I'm trying to can get you to know all that. So I, I, I also understand that you might not not have all the information available at your hands. So there's this trade-off uh, that I need to figure out how to how to do that. But hopefully you will indulge me and allow me to go a little bit as fast as I'm going, or maybe I'll slow down a little bit, but you guys have to also pick up a little bit more so that, you know, we, we have an excellent outcome for everyone, right? So I, I feel like I've taught you something and you guys actually have learned something, so therefore, when you get your first 
you know, make your first tens of millions of dollars, you can say, hey, it was all because of that guy Stan at Melbourne Union. All right. Um, let me ask a, a quick Who doesn't know about S parameters? S parameters. Really? <laughs> okay. All right. What I'll do is I will put some I will put some material on S parameters on the um, uh, how do you call it on LMS for you. Okay. Because you need to have S parameters um, because that's you know has anyone used a vector network analyzer? Guys, in like you, you guys are fin finishing, right? Next year, you, you're going to be all masters of electrical and electronic engineering, correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and this is the last semester, right? Yeah. Okay. No. No. Uh, I still have one year. You still have one year. Okay. So, okay, you got a year to learn stuff, um, but everyone else is finishing, pretty much. Is that correct? Okay. All right, let me put as much material up there as I can. Um, now, look, I'll, be, I'll try to be as gentle as possible, but remember, my, my job is also to try to teach you as much as possible, right? So you can, when you leave here, you can be like, ah, oh, jeez, I really learned something great from, from this bold guy, Stan. He was, he was great, you know? He really, he really made this big difference for us. All right, I'll, I'll do that. I'll put some more stuff up there. And what I'll do is I'll also try to find... Um, of course, you've got the workshops and the tutorials. What I'll try to do is find some, uh, some problems and some stuff that I can put on the LMS, some extra problems and working things that, things that you can work out and do on your own. And hopefully, I can find stuff that's also got some examples so you can go through it. All right. But the S parameters are going to be absolutely key when we're designing, when we're looking at um, uh, you know, transmission lines, when we're looking at matching. And when we're looking at things like designing power amplifiers uh, and the like. Yeah. All right, cool. See you all next week. Have an enjoyable uh, weekend. Yes. Do we have consultation? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I haven't set a time yet. Can I, can I tell you on Monday? I, I'm sure. sure. I'm going to work out a time. But yes. I think we now have a bunch of questions. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll put one up. I have a that's just uh, efficiency due to dielectric and resistive losses in the antenna. It's just efficiency and it's just related to loss. And it's loss due to dielectric loss or conductance loss in the antenna. It's a scalar. It's a scalar from one from one to zero. Okay. Right. So both a lossless antenna has got efficiency of one, and then you go. Oh, I've got some examples which I'll show you. I didn't, I didn't get two of them, um, but if you look at towards the end of the lecture notes, uh, lecture notes. Hopefully, I've got it here. Yeah, I've got an example. Uh, yeah, I say like ECDs, lossless one, and then I've even got one where I've got, when I'm talking about gain, where I include, um, you know, other stuff in there. All right. Okay. I haven't said it yet. Can I, I'll, can I tell you next week? Or okay. You go on Tuesday. Okay. Sorry, I haven't said it yet. And that's why I said I'll, I'll definitely say it. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, go. Yes. I got a couple of questions, and uh, I don't know why C one R is equal to C two R in this. Okay, it's just an example. But I don't have to do. Ah, so uh, it could be anything. So maybe the direction uh, is different when we saw this. Uh, okay. Right. So. So this is what I was saying. In an antenna, yes. all right, it could be this can be thirty degrees, and the other one could be sixty degrees. But it just depends on the panel of the antenna. All right, yeah, yeah. right. Now, 
I just use an example where it's 30 and 30, right? But it could be anything. It could be 27 and 42. It could be any numbers, all right? And, and all I've done is, because this looks like a cone, it's approximately theta 1 equals to theta 2. But it doesn't have to be. Theta 1 and theta 2 could be 